You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Okay, let's open in prayer. We'll pray for Jess as we're, as we're praying. Lord, we come to you this morning thankful for those who have gone before and, and protected this country by giving themselves in sacrifice or in, in service. And so we bring that up to you this morning, grateful that you have had your hand on this country. Uh, don't know how long, but we do know that those of your people, we are grateful to you for what you have done in this nation. And this morning, as we come to your word, we come to it expectant, knowing that out of it are the issues of life, and that you take care of your children by giving to them your revelation so that everything they might need to know to be godly and to live quietly and properly in Christ Jesus is is presented therein. And so as we read your word and as as we, in a sense, dissect it this morning, Lord, guide us, give us wisdom and help us to apply it to our lives in a way that will bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians, chapter, not the whole, and then I stop, and you're thinking the whole book. Chapter 11, from verse 1 through 22, which is where we will stop today, because um, the Lord's Supper starts at verse 23, and in order to handle that effectively, we will need an entire, probably an entire Sunday school morning. So chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1, Be imitators of me, (laughs) just as I also am of Christ. Now, I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Remember that verse. Remember verse 2 when we get a little farther in. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same with her whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of the man, nor is man independent of the woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray with her head with head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. But in giving this instruction, harking back to verse 2, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. So Paul has another difficulty for for which he needs to correct the Corinthian church, in which he needs to correct the Corinthian church. And this is a serious one when we come to it, the, the, the misuse of the Lord's Supper, which was a tradition handed down by the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, We read about it in John chapter 13 in the Upper Room Discourse, Um, and we will get to that. But uh, this morning, I thought about bringing a tape measure to measure everyone's hair so we'd know what the proper length was, but I don't have a a tape measure that measures in cubits. Uh, I've got inches and feet, so I couldn't 
come up with the proper measurement for this morning's purposes. And that's what it's going to sound like, but indeed we don't do that here. So last, last time I was with you, we, we, we finished with verse 12. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. It's as if Paul was going through a litany of reasons why the man, the woman would be submissive and the man would be in authority, but he had to remind men that in Christ, as far as salvation, as far as access to the Father, as far as Christianity itself, there's perfect equality. So all the man, he says, the man has his birth through the women and all things originate from God. So the first woman was created from the first man, but ever since that time, men have come through women. Men and women have different roles, but they are of equal importance. Here Paul sets up a play, counterplay, showing that despite the origin, or maybe because of the origin, the women of women, the change reminds men of the equality of the sexes. Unless either of them become too arrogant in their roles, he reminds them First of all, that everything comes from God. And earlier, he said that neither one is independent of the other. We need each other. God created us that way, and it's properly. It's proper for us to need each other. It should remove any tendency. It should remove any tendency towards a superior, superiority complex. Unfortunately, as our societies have been able to ascertain down through the centuries, we can easily find reasons to have superiority complexes. And it can include anything from our sex to our hair length to our, the way we dress to the way we talk to the, to the societies we belong to to the way we punctuate our sentences with correct grammar. There's all kinds of things we can use to assume a false superiority over others. The gospel makes everyone equal. The gospel is equally applied to everyone as they receive it from the, by the election of God. So in verse 13, continuing on in this vein, Paul says, judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Here Paul appeals to the Corinthians' own understanding. Culturally and for many centuries prior, it was common for women to pray and prophesy with their heads covered. This was a symbol of subordination to man and reflected the natural order of things as understood in those cultures. So we're looking at in Corinth, and in that time, Paul is dealing with a group of people where if to deviate from the accepted cultural norms, it would communicate a false, it would communicate false information to the society at large about Christianity. And he didn't want any negative connotations coming from their, their church life, if you will. And it still plays down through today, uh, although not maybe as, as, I don't know, consistently maybe the word, might not have a, a good word for that, but at least I'm not, my thesaurus isn't working this morning. Verse 14, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? I'm not going to try and tidy this verse up. I had a, a discussion with a Tidy it up means make it say something it doesn't say, by the way. I had a fella in the store a, wheel, a weeks back who he and I, he began teaching me, if you will, on, and, and I can be taught. That isn't what I meant, but he had, a, as Jim pointed out, he had a different hermeneutic than I do. And he was reading into text things that just weren't there. And, and my consistent comment to him was, but as I, the text doesn't say that. Well, and he would launch into a reason why it should have, essentially. And he would get to another point, and I'd say, but, and I, I would make a point, and he'd say, well, that just can't be right because, and I'd say, but that's what the text says. What are you going to do with that? I actually made him quite uncomfortable and angry, and I pointed out that he was getting angry, which was the wrong thing to do. By the way, don't take your cues about how to have interpersonal relationships from me, because <laughs> I don't... I don't seem to have that down yet. I'm not sure if it was what I said or how I said it, but when I said, you seem to be getting angry, he really got angry. It was kind of like, cue anger. How do I do that again? You know. Anyway, so Paul says, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, is a dishonor to him? Here Paul 
appeals to nature. Customarily, men wore their hair short. There were many reasons for this. The fact that men generally did the more outdoor heavy lifting work and, long, uh, and, and other types of work, long hair, just plain and simple, got in the way. Also, and though this is not universal, over a broad swath of history and culture, men have just generally worn their hair shorter and women have just generally worn their hair longer. It's just when you, there are exceptions. Sparta comes to mind, although we know a little bit more about Sparta than, than uh, enough about Sparta to understand that there were other things that worked there. <laughs> Strange place. But uh, there, are, there are cultures where women wore short hair and men wear long hair, or, or they both wear it long, or they... But Paul is appealing to the general broad swath of history. Uh, if a woman has long hair in verse 15, and I'll ask questions for the last three verses in just a minute. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Covering, Finishing up the statement, Paul, still encouraging the Corinthians to judge for themselves based on the accepted norms in their society, that for a woman, he points out, long hair is a glory. Indeed, it is a natural covering. For these reasons... She should not go against the culturally accepted norms and come off looking like either a feminist or a prostitute, communicating false information about the church. Both of those, feminists and prostitutes, have rejected the way God made them. A final thought on this, just for those who are interested in this kind of thing, I am, uh, just as not necessarily this doesn't supplant the Word of God, but it kind of adds to it. It's been noted scientifically that there are three distinct stages of development in the hair. There's uh, formation and growth, stage one, resting, and then fallout. How many men in here have, have run into fallout? <laughs> right, but, but whatever falls out of a woman's head, it seems to be replaced rather quickly. But I, I know of a few men who have had the fallout and no replacement. <laughs> there's, a, there's a word for that. It's called baldness. Um, Women tend to stay in the first stage longer due to the hormone estrogen, and which results in longer hair. It's just, just the way it works. Uh, since men have testosterone, this speeds up the cycle so that men reach the third stage earlier than women. And this is why men are often bald or balding. Bald women are extremely rare. How many of you have seen a bald woman? But was it caused by chemotherapy? Or was it natural? It happens. But it's the, it's the exception, the very rare exception rather than the rule. Whereas with men, I, don't, I never looked up percentages, but it's common. It's very common for men to, to, bald, to go bald. And, it's, and the other thing that just occurred to me, it's like, it's like getting even, you know, because it's the woman that carries the gene to get bald. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> you jerk. Okay. The point here in both verses 14 and 15 is not to determine the cubit length for a, the hair on a man's head. Rather, it is the package, part of the package that Paul is presenting to the Corinthians that in their culture, women should not dispense with the veil, which both gives them the authority to pray and prophesy, and it marks them as women of God. Further, it continues this simple idea that men should look like men and women should look like women. And it should be relatively easy to tell the difference. So women, even with the shorter hair, they have different hairstyles than men do, don't they? Even in our society. You can generally tell. And that's a good thing. We should be able to tell. You should be able to look at someone, and look at their face, look at their hair, and come to some conclusions about whether or not they're male or female. Pardon? You used to? You still can for the most part. For the most part. <laughs> um, what does it mean in our culture? Well, it means pretty much the same as it is meant in most of the cultures on the planet. And I, I, like I said, I couldn't clean this verse up for you. It's what it says is what it says. Generally speaking, men's hair will be shorter than women's. Even in the culture of Paul's time, though, this is not a hard and fast rule because the Nazarite would purposefully let his hair grow longer as part of his vow keeping, part of the, the Nazarite tradition. So there are exceptions. But generally speaking, it should be easy to tell women from men. It just shouldn't. Jim. Ephesus.
Did everyone hear that? Paul actually probably took a Nazarite vow, let his hair grow, and at some point it, it grew out, and then he cut it off when his vow was uh, con con confirmed or finished. So even Paul the Apostle was part of the exception. But there's a saying about law, about making law. Never make law based on exceptions. Laws based on exceptions make bad laws. And I'll just leave that at that. Any comments about these verses? About long hair, short hair? Lanny. Yeah, verse 13. I don't know. I don't know if I just don't see the Did you answer the question? There's a question mark there. Judge for yourselves, it is, prop is it proper to pray for a, a woman to pray with her head uncovered? <coughs> In that culture? No. No. Any other questions or comments? Um, and I, it's not related to that, but um, even in this culture in the, in the Middle East, some women have are covered and some aren't. Right. Because I, I just recently learned that the, I was just curious, the women don't have to cover the, the neck of their And the Shiites do. And the Shiites do. Yeah, it's part of their culture. And in, in those cultures, people will make assumptions about a woman based on how she's dressed. They will also make assumptions about a man based on how he's dressed. And I, I would say this, assumptions are generally a bad thing, especially in our society. It's better to do what Matthew 5 talks about and what first, uh, Galatians 6 talks about. Go talk to the person. Go, go break a conversation open if you have a concern. Don't just assume things. Assumptions are the root of so much evil in life and so much strife and so much discord and death and destruction in, in some cultures. And we just shouldn't be guilty of that. We should never assume. Um, I could go into great detail about some of my misassumptions over the years, but you already know I'm an idiot, so I don't need to. Um, generally speaking, it's not generally speaking, almost without exception, it's better to get the words from the horse's mouth. Now I'm calling people horses. Yeah, that's really good. But you all, isn't it interesting how we have all those cliches? Did, you all knew what I meant, didn't you? You know exactly. You, you, didn't, you didn't picture a horse. You just you pictured talking to somebody. Good. Okay. Any other questions about those three verses? Verse 16. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. No. Paul, nobody in the Corinthian church would be contentious. They love one another. They take care of one another. They don't argue. They don't sue each other. Oh, wait. Maybe they do. Chapter 6. The word contentious. This is the word where someone likes contentiousness. He's the guy who stirs the pot intentionally trying to mess the cooking up to see what the cook will do. <laughs> What if I throw in some basil, you know? I don't even know what basil is, but it's probably not the right thing to throw into hamburger. Or is it? Okay, well, I, choose, I chose the wrong analogy, but, but you get my point. He likes argument. He likes discussion that leads to strife. He likes to stir things up. This is the person Paul's talking to, and apparently there were plenty of them in the Corinthian church. He dispenses with those who love to argue. So these are people who dispute even clear things just to make a point. In almost every era, indeed in every era, there are those who dislike God's ways and rail against them. In Corinth, in this particular case, it was both the men and the women warring against different aspects of God's order. This carries through to today, and, and as we dislike and rebel against the principles of Scripture, we reap a harvest of destruction in our lives. Paul sums up this argument, declaring that women are to be submissive and men are in, to be in authority, but that submission is to be an intelligent, qualified submission, and that authority is to be a loving, serving, and caring authority that has at its root a desire to serve those who are under its authority, under their authority. Paul also notifies in this the Corinthians that all other churches and all the other apostles are firmly committed to this very same idea. Just in case you think you can leave Kootenai community and go to another Bible-leaving, doctrine-preaching church, you can get out from under God's scripture. Ain't going to happen. 
they're going to be believing the same thing. They're going to be teaching the same thing. The practice of women wearing longer hair and men wearing shorter hair. This is the idea he's discussing. The point is that all the apostles and all the churches agree that men should look and act like men, and women should look and act like women. Whatever it is in a culture that distinguishes men from women, that should be practiced. And I, I don't know how far in to get this into, into our anecdotal information, but I see some things, they're pretty stressful that men are involved in doing. I mean, okay, now, you're, now maybe I'm being judgmental, and if I am, somebody come up here and slap me. But I don't think men belong on a fashion ramp. I'm not so sure I agree with fashion ramps, period. But on a fashion ramp wearing a romper? Do you know how hard it is to clean vomit off a computer screen? <laughs> what have we come to? And I've got some frowns out there. They're not sure what I'm talking about. You don't need to know. Don't look. It'll just ruin your day. Okay, now I'm getting too specific. But the point is, in those pictures, you cannot tell. You cannot tell. And that's the important thing. The important thing is God made us different. If we were all the same, half of us would be unnecessary. He made us different on purpose. Let's live like it's a good thing. Any questions about verse 16, about being contentious? And I'd be cautious about being too contentious about this verse. Jenny. You are. But Paul is counseling... If you're contending for the right things and you're not just being contentious to be contentious, then you're in good territory. Paul is talking about people confusing the genders and then being contentious about that. So, yes, some could say, as Jenny has pointed out, that just by purposefully being distinct in the way you dress and act, you could be considered being contentious today. And yes, in some places you would be considered being contentious. I say, bring it on. It's okay. That's not the contention Paul is talking about. He's talking about contending against the natural order God has created. And he's talking especially about contending against that natural order just to be contentious, just to be a jerk. That's what he's talking about because that's what this word means. Philo nikos. Philo from the Greek word love. I love messing things up. I love getting in people's faces. I love fouling up the, 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 the natural order of things just to see what kind of a mess it causes. And we know there's plenty of people like that. Any other comments or questions? Did that help? It's okay to be properly, uh, what's another word I'm looking for? Properly, biblically contentious by being scriptural. Not in your face scriptural, but just by following what God has designed men and women to follow. Verse 17. Verse 2 said, Now, I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But verse 17 says, But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better but for the worse. Now he's jumped into <coughs> their, their, uh, their meeting practices. What, what is going on when they meet? Actually, he hasn't jumped into it. He's just continuing it because the, the way men and women were wearing their covering and not wearing their covering during their meetings was also a problem. But he says, I don't praise you because you're coming together not for the better, but for the worse. Now, he's talking about, let's put it in our context. Sunday mornings, we get together at Kootenai Community, and we get together to see how much we can foul things up, to see how much of God's natural order we can dispute and argue against to see how we can harm one another. Now, it's not necessarily intentionally that way, but that's what's happening in, Cor in Corinth. People are being sued when there should be arranged discussions between brothers and sisters who have problems. People are allowing filthy practices to go on when there should be proper confrontation so that this doesn't happen. Praying and prophesying is being done in a way that confuses the society around them. Is this even a Christian church? Those kinds of things shouldn't happen. And so along with that, we're going to be getting to the Lord's Supper. And like I said last earlier th uh, this morning, we won't get into the Lord's Supper proper because there's so much there as I've been studying it 
that uh, it will take a, a full morning. He says, so in verse 2, Paul praises the Corinthians for they remembered some things that he taught him. Here, however, he does not praise them. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us, gave us two ordinances to keep in the church, baptism and communion. communion. He gave baptism as a command that his followers should do, emulating his example when he was baptized by John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, which is a sign that a person has trusted Christ for salvation, that he is one of the elect. Is it, is it, uh, does it confer any special um, sanctification on the person? It doesn't save you. It doesn't. But what it does is it communicates to your brothers and sisters in the church and to the Lord Jesus your obedience to a command of Scripture and to the Lord Jesus. Paul does not, the, the second thing he gave was um, in the upper room, he, Jesus during his last Passover meal gave the ordinance of communion or the Lord's Supper. Paul does not praise the Corinthians here because they have in Corinthian fashion botched Paul's original instruction. The communion meal, which should have been the most unifying part of the worship service, had become divisive. It had become the opposite of what was intended. The polar opposite. The Corinthians had taken the unifying communion service and made it something that was dividing people and causing grief in the church and damaging relationships. And, and to the apostles, to Paul, especially in this case, that's almost one of the most horrifying things he could imagine. And you'll see when he, we get into this a little bit. Because he says this, for, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and, and I partly believe it. When the early church came together, they were there for four things. There were four things that marked their meetings. Obedience to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. That's what the early church met to do. They met to do essentially what we have had conferred upon us throughout the history of the Christian church. We meet and we, we go through the doctrine. We, we have a, a heavy emphasis here on doctrine, but also on living it out. We, we fellowship. We spend time together. We get to know one another. Two fellows in the same ship. You get to know one another, each another. You get to know each other's strengths. You get to know each other's weaknesses. And you, you become brothers and sisters in a real way, in the Lord. In uh, breaking of bread, we don't do this. And interestingly enough, and I just thought about this this morning as I was studying this over, but right after a really cool thing happens, sometimes it, <laughs> the, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't just qualify as really cool. That was a horrible analogy. This was the most momentous thing in the history of the universe that had happened. And when it happened... Okay, we're back on. And when it happened, immediately after that, some traditions were, were established. And these were some of the traditions that carried through to the time of Paul. And uh, slowly but surely, they, they... I don't know what the word would be, they evolved into other things. So we don't ce celebrate communion every Sunday but we do celebrate it once a month. And it's a special, solemn time where we, we remember. We remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in some homes, there's, there are some historians of the early church uh, that believe that a couple of things. The communion meal apparently was celebrated every time the church got together, every week. And there are some who believe that in some homes, communion was celebrated at every meal. This was just in the years right after the resurrection when this was fresh in people's minds. People who had seen the, re, the, the resurrected, they saw him. They talked to the Lord Jesus after he resurrected. Can you imagine what that would do to your life? It should do that to our lives today. But imagine being there. Imagine how that would change your traditions. And so they would establish these traditions. And so many of the homes celebrated communion every meal. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner if they had three meals. I guess I didn't study that out. I don't know if they had three meals. And I wonder if they had the approved government list of cereals and meats and everything that contributed to your health. I hope they did. I hope they did. Pardon me? Warning labels, Warning labels yeah, probably. Missing children on their milk. 
So in many of the early congregations, the special fellowship meals came to be called love feasts, and they usually ended with the observance of communion. These were meals that were celebrated together, and each one would bring what they could. Unfortunately, in Corinth, these meals had devolved into factions where different groups would gather to the exclusion of other groups. They would click up. So the lawyers would only eat with the... I'm, I'm making this up to some degree, but probably not. The lawyers would only eat with other lawyers. Maybe that's okay. No, I didn't say that. The doctors would eat with other doctors. Um, the home... The mothers would, would eat with other... You know, you get what I'm talking about. They would click up. Um, the rich would come early and hurriedly eat what they brought. The poor, especially the slaves who maybe looked forward to this meal as the one decent meal they would get the entire week because they couldn't come until they had finished all their duties, um, would arrive later, and when nothing was available, they would possibly, in discouragement and anger, group up with those of their class and become even more contentious. contentious. The gospel destroys class. It unites the beggar with the billionaire. It brings together the slave and the master. In these dysfunctional Corinthian meals, the opposite, the very opposite had happened. The, the groups were polarized and had become distant from each other. Paul says that he partly believes this report probably because he wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt. This was over the top, even for Corinthians. And he needed to make sure it was actually happening because it just should not happen. This meal where the Lord Jesus Christ got on his knees and washed the feet of the disciples, the rabbi washed the feet of the taught the one who would sacrifice his life for the church, spent time feeding the disciples. The very same arrogance, this very same arrogance that would result in women not wanting to be women and men not wanting to be men also results in the selfishness that was destroying the communion that should be bringing the called out ones together. By the way, whenever the word church is used in the New Testament, it never is describing a building. It's always describing about the believers themselves, the called out ones, the ecclesia, those who have been called out not to be like the world, or even in this case, worse than the world. They were called out to be different. They were called out to be a blessing to one another. They were called out to serve one another. They were called out to take care of one another. They were called out to see to each other's needs. They were called out to serve and build each, one, each other up. They were called out to provide for one another. They were called to be blessed in the fact that they were able to provide for one another. This was not happening in Corinth. And Paul says, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Schismata, schisms. Earthquake caused rifts between people. And, and if we don't deal with them, they get worse, and they get worse, and they get worse, until you, only, only the Holy Spirit can bring people back together. Any questions, comments? So this was going on in Corinth. And, and it's almost like each successive wrong builds on the last one. And frankly, that's how it works. Because these kinds of things don't come from one mistake. They come from a worldview. And in this particular case, this worldview was, Scripture isn't that important and I'm selfish. Verse 19, for there must also be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In every gathering of Christians, at some point, it is possible for there to be heresies among the gathering. One of the reasons this occurs, or I should say uh, one of the positive outtakes of this, is that those who are faithful to Scripture will be revealed, and those who are not will be revealed. This is actually a positive thing because it offers the opportunity for those in positions of leadership and responsibility to teach those to help those, to counsel those who are mistaken. It offers the opportunity for heretics, as it were, to repent and come into the kingdom. Paul is just expressing the fact that as we see in our world together, in our world today, stuff happens. Uh, another positive aspect is that the church body knows who to entrust leadership to and, uh, and who not to entrust leadership, this responsibility to. The other thing that will happen in inevitably especially in a strong church, is that those who are not of us will go out from us, that it will be made evident that they were not of us in the first place. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that it might be made, but they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But let the truth drive them out. Let 
Let them be driven out by the uncompromising but careful exposition of the scripture, of the truth, not by Corinthian actions, not by selfishness, not by me first, not by refusing to give, but only taking. That's what was driving the people out of the Corinthian church and driving them apart. And so then verse 20 says, When you come together, therefore, into play, one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Whatever you are doing when you come together, in one place, Paul says, you are not eating Lord's Supper. You supposedly come together for communion, but it is disruption that happens. You supposedly come together to unify, but schisms occur. You supposedly come together to serve one another, but no service happens, and you take from one another. You have taken the beautiful and solemn gift that the Lord Jesus gave to the apostles in the upper room and turned it into a scarecrow of its intention. And the one to whom you are supposedly honoring, the one whom you are supposedly honoring, has no part in it. It's not the Lord's Supper. Any questions or comments? This is a, this is, he's being, this is harsh. This is, so, so is it ever appropriate when someone is violating the word of God to be a bit harsh with them? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Why we are being harsh and what brings us to it is very important. It has to be serious violations or violations of God's word. And it has to be given in a spirit of humility and a wish to unify whoever is bringing the delivery. If they have to be harsh, it has to be clear that they want God's word to be honored. They want healing to occur. And it's evident to them that the only way healing is going to occur is by being forceful and necessarily even loud about it, forcefully loud. For in eating every one, for in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Um, as mentioned earlier, this misshapen celebration that was happening, early birds were eating up the food that was available. Some were going completely without, and others were getting drunk. William Barclay explains it this way. Um, the ancient world was in many ways much more social than ours is. It was the regular custom for groups of people to meet together for meals. There was in particular a certain kind of feast called an eranus, to which each participant brought his own share of the food. What do we call those today? Potlucks. What's that? Multiple choice. <laughs> I wonder why the word luck is in there. No, we're not going to go there. Okay. A certain kind of feast called Iranus, to which each person brought his own share of the food, in which all of the contributions were pooled to make a common meal. The early church had such a custom, a feast called the Agape, or love feast. To it, all the Christians came, bringing what they could. The resources were pooled, and they sat down to a common meal. It was a lovely custom, and it is to our loss that the custom has vanished. It was a way of producing and nourishing real Christian fellowship. But in the church at Corinth, things had gone sadly wrong with the love feast. In the church, there were rich and poor. There were those who could bring plenty, and there were, there were slaves who could hardly bring, in, bring hardly anything at all. In fact, for many a poor slave, the love feast must have been the only decent meal in the whole week. But in Corinth, the art of sharing had got lost. The rich did not share their food, but ate it in little exclusive groups by themselves, hurrying through it in case they had to share, while the poor had next to nothing. The result was that the meal at which the social differences between members of the church should have been obliterated only succeeded in aggravating these same differences. Unhesitatingly and unsparingly, Paul rebukes this. He's rebuking them. He's harshly calling them to account. You are not doing what was intended. This is not even a vapor of what the Lord Jesus intended. What you are doing is wicked to one another. That's what Paul was saying to a church, probably on a Sunday morning. I'm making this up now. Up in front, pointing his finger. This was horrifying, and he was horrified by it. And so then he says, really? That would be the translation today. What? Have you not houses and to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. The facial how much of How much of communication is body language? Anybody? 75% is what I've heard. So you never get the whole skinny when you're talking on the phone. And you don't get anything when you're texting. Unless they really have a, a, an ability to use capital letters. Then you can get everything, you know. The point is, what? 
Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise? What were they doing to the church of God? They were despising it. They were hating it. He's incensed at this behavior, and it comes out in his choice of words. Today, I said we would use that expression, really. If you are starving, eat at home. This is an opportunity for you rich folks to truly serve your poorer brethren, and you shame them instead. This not only shows selfishness, but it shows that you actually hate the other called out ones that God has chosen. I cannot praise you, Paul says. What should I really say to you? This is a rhetorical question. And Paul follows it up with a statement that they are not praiseworthy in this behavior. It is shameful behavior. More than at any other time, the Lord's Supper should bring the church together. This is the actual remembrance of the cross and all that it accomplished and changed. The most selfless and giving act in the history of the entire universe had been perverted into a taking, into a disservice. It is the celebration of redemption and service, and it has been prostituted to gluttony, drunkenness, and selfishness. In short, the Lord's Supper was a celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It was not for satisfying hunger. For that, they had their own homes. And so, with this polemic introduction, Paul begins discussing the Lord's Supper. One commentator put it like this, and this is why I want to stop here. Um, this was like having a diamond dropped in a muddy road. Because what we're going to go through next, uh, this beautiful passage that we're going to be going through next from, from verse 23 on for a ways, comes on the heels of a strong, ringing rebuke of bad behavior. Paul was rebuking the Corinthians, the Corinthian Christians. He's rebuking Christ Christians, by the way. That's what he's talking. He's talking to believers who had perverted and turned on its head the ceremony that Jesus himself had given to the church to celebrate him, to celebrate his gift, his selflessness, and his redemption of the called out ones, the very ones who were using that ceremony to get something. And so, we're going to end there. Are there any questions or comments? That's kind of a disservice to you, but Sunday school is only 45 minutes long, and the next section will take at least that long. But the Lord's Supper is a beautiful celebration, a wondrous thing. Uh, I don't know that I, I don't understand it all. I think when I get to heaven, I'm going to go, oh, so that's what, I, okay. It's even more incredible than I think any of us can really imagine. But it's a celebration of selflessness, sacrifice, giving, redemption, salvation, things that none of us can do without the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as a matter of fact, some of it we can't do. Only the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, could do it. And he did it for the Corinthians, and they're perverting it. And Paul is saying, and I still get that, but I partly believe it. I'm trying to give you the benefit of the doubt, but I'd sure like to drive down there in my chariot and figure this out with you. So any comments or questions before we close? So you might read chapter 11, verses 23 through the end of the chapter uh, next week. He still has a little bit of We'll never get that far. But he still has a little bit of rebuke for them. But more than anything, he's going to deliver to them what was given to him directly through the, through the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ himself because he was an apostle of God. Let's pray. Father, if there's any of this that you see in any of us, Lord, rebuke us. Let us be made aware of it. Selfishness and pride have no place at the foot of the cross. Selfishness and pride have no place in the church of the, of the living God. And so we pray, Lord, as, as we listen to the words of Paul, as he rebukes the errant Corinthian Christians, if there be any of this that we might need to, de to tend to, Lord, let it happen. But as I see this church serving and loving you, Lord, I'm grateful to belong to a body that, that wants to hear the truth, that is subservient, submissive to the truth, and is willing to change where change be needed and to continue where continuation be needed. And so thank you, and strengthen, strengthen those things we do. Give us wisdom for the future in, uh, in our dealings with people. And Lord, might each of us come away from this teaching this morning uh, reminded of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for the called out ones, his elect, his believers, his children, the bride that you have given him. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. 
If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.